Welcome to the Cashflow Champs Podcast, the show where we demystify real estate investing so you have the tools you need to gain financial freedom through passive investments in real estate. And now your host, Cashflow Champs Managing Partner, Prashant Kumar. This is Prashant Kumar and Paul Sr. from Cashflow Champs. Uh, here you are listening to Cashflow Champs Real Estate Podcast. We have an esteemed guest today with us, Bikram Sandhu from Rise 48. Bikram, thank you so much for your time today. Welcome to the show. Of course. No, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Prashant. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm really, really excited to be here. Sounds good. Bikram is the CEO, CEO CFO, and co-founder of Rise 48 Equity and Rise 48 Communities. Bikram's main responsibilities as CEO includes overseeing, underwriting, asset management, and investor relations for all the assets. Bikram's main responsibilities as CFO include overseeing accounting, finance, and treasury at Rice 48 Equity and Rice 48 Communities. He resides in Scottsdale, Arizona with his wife, Alice Penn. Bikram has a professional background in adult and assurance services where he worked at PwC LLP and audited Fortune 100 companies as well as pre-IPO companies. Bikran also worked at CNM LLP and has a professional background in management consulting services related to SOX compliance, risk advisory and transactional accounting advisory services for Fortune 500 companies. He holds bachelors of science in economics with an emphasis in accounting and graduated cum laude from the University of California, Irvine. Become very impressive resume. Of course, you are doing good things at Rise 48. You have worked at PwC. I've been, I worked with PwC SOX compliance all my life. Uh, I've been an IT consultant for, for years, you know, for 20 years actually. Nice. So I know in and out how these companies work. So the great background, by the way. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit more about you. I mean, I know I formally introduced you, but tell us from your horse's mouth where you come from and how come you are here where you are right now. Just tell us a little bit more. Of course, yeah. So no, thanks for the background there, Prashant. Appreciate it. And that's, you know, that's really the gist of it. So when I, I left college uh, uh, after I graduated in 2012, moved into audit and advisory uh, practice at, at uh, I actually started at Grant Thornton, spent about a year there and then moved into uh, PwC and spent three years there. So, um, you know, throughout my career at, at an, an audit, I primarily uh, focused on Fortune 100 companies or Fortune 500 companies and early growth growth stage or very small startup companies. So really kind of, you know, cut my teeth on trying to figure out a, you know, how these companies are run and B, how do you make sure that whatever they're presenting to their stakeholders is complete and accurate from a financial statements perspective. So, you know, learning about the ins and outs was definitely very important for my career growth and career progression. But, you know, around the tail end of my career at PwC, I really wanted to start looking at the the all the financials from a perspective of management as opposed to an auditor. Um, and as an auditor, you know, you really kind of see everything once it's already done. You're kind of looking at the back view mirror, seeing what's, what's already passed and trying to make sure that's presented appropriately to the investors and to the stakeholders of the company. Uh, what I wanted to do was get into the management side and see, okay, well, how can I craft and how can I be a key member of management to make sure that the results are a, uh, you know, a byproduct of, of the work that, that we've done as opposed to more of like an, a review of the work that, that was done by someone else. So um, towards the tail end of PwC, I moved into CNM, which is, you know, a transaction advisory and a risk compliance advisory company. Um, and uh, I was, uh, you know, one of the first few people that they hired in Irvine, uh, which was their fir first, um, the second location that they had had, had uh, started up after the first location that was in headquartered in in Moulin Hills, but um, you know my my career at CNM, um, that's where I started learning about you know valuing other companies, selling divisions, buying other companies. How do you go from you know literally just starting a company to how do you forecast to make it go public in three to five years? And uh, really kind of learning about the processes of how do you, um, you know, in, in, incorporate another company that you just bought? Do you just bring on all the people? Do you, you know, do you find synergy somewhere where you can, your accounting team, for instance, can now look on two divisions as opposed to just your own division? And uh, in terms of valuations, uh, I helped companies kind of review 409A valuations where they would value out, you know, look like an income approach and, and capitalization approach.
approach method, five year models for DSC, uh, your discounted cash flow methods to you know see how companies are being valued and how it's being that that value is being allocated to all the assets and the liabilities of the companies that are being acquired. So um, that was really, I guess, the the second stepping stone uh, of my entire career where um, I really kind of had kind of built up my competitive advantage on uh, uh, company valuations. So around the tail end of uh, working at CNM, I started kind of getting into multifamily. You know, I had a couple of clients at, at PwC and, and uh, at CNM, which were, were in real estate. And it was it was interesting, you know, that these these deals were primarily like cash cows, really. You know, they were produce, producing a lot of income. And when they would sell the deals, you know, they would have this significant capitalization event that would help, you know, really, really return a lot of money for the investors. So um, I, you know, my, my then girlfriend, now wife and I, uh, we're kind of looking into it like our, you know, what are, what do you want to see in the next 30 years in our lives? So um, I started kind of modeling out, you know, like what type of passive income or secondary sources of income we need to kind of sub supplement our, our lifestyle and when could we retire on our end? So um, I think in, in late 2018, um, we we kind of were, I was kind of modeling it all out. And every single time I ran like a few, few different models. And every single time I, I would start with a single family house and end up at 20, 25 single family homes. And at that point I would jump to multifamily. And I was like, okay, well, why would I beat around the bush for 20 years buying single family homes and then get to multifamily? Why not just start now? So that's when I discovered, you know, that these apartment complexes all around our our nation really they're not, they're not owned by corporate mega companies. Uh, they're owned by investors um, that you know that own um, and operate these products. And uh, I wanted to be one of those investors. So um, around 2018, you know, we 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 had um, started going to meetups, started going to different um, conferences, started meeting people. Uh, we invested passively in a couple of deals, and and that's around early 2019. I met. Zach Haptenstall and Robert Shevchik, who are our co-founders, and uh, we started working together to buy deals together. And, um, you know, part of that uh, was uh, where we where we had kind of focused on was my competitive advantage, again, was on Excel and behind the computer. Like, I am not a sales guy. I cannot go to brokers and finesse them to like give us off market deals. I can't go to investors and you know like sell the company and and get you know 10 15 million dollars coming in every single deal. Um I'm I'm the I'm the guy that'll run operations on the back end and run the asset management and the underwriting so that when it is presented it's presented appropriately, it's presented accurately and the forecasts that we are using they're supported by financial analytics and not just you know some numbers somebody threw together. So um that's where my you know expertise lies in the company is making sure any data that's going out of the company is being vetted for uh, completeness and accuracy before it goes out to external stakeholders. Well, this is this is awesome that, you know, your journey, you know, from an auditor looking at the back view mirror into going into transactional accounting and making sure how the companies are valued, valued um, you know, and and on top of it, modeling your own personal life, you know, going into the single family. And I mean, I'm not, I mean, I've heard of it. I do it myself also, but not, not to that extent, you know, where I would you know, go say, listen, I, it's going to take me 25 single family homes to get into. And then I jump into multi family. Why not? Yeah. Now, I'm a similar, uh, you know, background, but more on the IT side. I jumped into single family and I spent like six months into single family. And then I said, listen, I'm, this is, I'm done. I don't want to, spend, I don't want to spend three to four months to buy a two hundred thousand dollar house and get two hundred dollar cash flow, and it's yep. just not yep. my time, you know. So, yeah. I mean, that's an incredible story, you know. Modeling your life, guys. I mean, those who are listening, model your life and see where, how you can make the best use of your time because time is limited. You know, you never know, right? I mean, time is is a limited commodity. Is is actually the the scariest commodity we don't realize it don't make it anymore yeah it's just <laughs> once a second is gone it's gone <laughs> a second gone is gone basically you just cannot get it back you know so no that that's awesome uh, so why multifamily you know why why not any other asset i mean based on what i have heard from you is you you would like to go and look at different things but why multifamily you know let's start, talk about that a little bit 
Yeah, of course. So, uh, you know, we've looked at different uh, different types of asset classes like re uh, retail. Um, we, we looked at offices very briefly. When, well, this was back in 2018 when I was uh, working with my wife only. Um, and then we also looked at, you know, industrial and, and self-storage and, and obviously single family and multifamily. And, you know, the main thing that we kept coming back to was everybody needs a place to live, right? It's, it's, uh, you're serving a purpose for someone's shelter. And, uh, you know, the, the type of, at the time, we weren't really looking at, you know, whether we would do 80s value add or, you know, new build or anything. We we're just thinking, okay, well, of all the different asset classes, at the very least, you'll need a place to live. So let's start there. Let's start with a, uh, you know, a, an, a, uh, a section of the market or sector of the market that we're somewhat familiar with because I used to rent apartments, you know, when I was younger, I knew how they kind of, you know, from a tenant's perspective, how, how, how you kind of, you know, live at those apartments and like what purposes they serve. So we, you know, by all means, we're not land, we weren't landlords that we, we knew what to do, but at least we knew that I'd, I'd never had to uh, use any self storage. Um, you know, we I used to work in an office. Uh, I didn't retail centers weren't really like my expertise because I didn't know how. You know, we would see like new restaurants pop up here and there, and then they'd go away after six months, and another restaurant would pop up. I kind of didn't know all the um, ins and outs of that. So multifamily and, and single family was really something that we were comfortable with. And from a single family perspective, my mom actually used to rent a home in Fresno, California herself. Uh, and, you know, that gave me a little bit of, uh, you know, knowledge about how she kind of ran that business. And she was kind of like a forced landlord. Like we, we had bought that house and then we had moved. And then instead of selling the house, we just kind of kept it for, uh, for cash flow purposes, which, you know, it turned out we didn't really make a lot of money on that one. But it, again, it was that experience of knowing that, hey, you can provide shelter for somebody else in, in return for, you know, rent payments on our end. So that's really what kind of kept me in that space. It's not to say, you know, industrial or retail or any of the other sectors aren't good. It's just we never kind of explored it um, because we were just so comfortable with multifamily. So that's why we kind of uh, started with that and stuck with, with, with multifamily on our end. You know, Bikram, your, your your resume is so impressive, like Rashawn said. I just want to, you know, it's an awesome thing. We appreciate you coming on. One of the questions I have is, um, it looked like you didn't have a lot of folks uh, in your life, maybe not other than your mom who had a single family, whatever. What were some of the challenges coming from the profession that you have to where you're going to multifamily? What were some of the challenges that you run into? And you may want to share with our audience just to prep themselves in terms of make a successful transition like you did. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So when we started, the first deal that we ever bought was, it was called Silver Oaks, 36 units. It was in kind of a rough area in Phoenix, you know, it, was, it wasn't the best area, but in 2019, honestly, if you get a, get a deal under contract, you're kind of blessed, honestly. So uh, we, uh, you know, instead of syndicating anything on the front end, and the very first deal that we acquired, I had put in my own capital. Um, Zach had put it in his, his own money. Robert had put it in his own money. And then we had found a tenant in common or a tick investor that, uh, you know, was coming out of a 1031. They needed to place capital somewhere. They were looking for a deal. So we all kind of came in as co-owners. Like I, I think up until that point in my life, I had saved like to $250,000 total. And I put in $150,000 into that one deal. And it was a big risk that we took. Um, and at the time, I didn't have any experience in multifamily. I did not know how apartments are run. Right. All I knew was, you know, I'd underwritten deals up until that point, obviously, from like a numbers perspective, I, I knew how they were run. But from an actual operational side, I didn't. So the one thing that I did was I kind of just submerged myself in anything related to apartments. Um, I when when that when we closed the deal, I was helping the property manager essentially do the accounting side of it. Uh, I was on the weekly calls with the property manager to make sure that you know whatever they were doing from an operational perspective, I knew what was happening. I was you know volunteering to do the reporting for them so that I would understand what's going on in and out of the property. So you know lease expirations, move-ins, move-outs. Uh, units rent ready, renovations. I was handling the CapEx invoices that were coming in. You know, Zach and, and Robert, they were actually, they were in Phoenix at the time. So they knew like they were going to the sites, making sure the work was being done. But from a, you know, from an office, like remote perspective, because I was in California at the time, I was trying to be as involved as I could be. So I could take in all the knowledge I could. So I didn't have any like GP promote or anything, any, any sort of cash compensation that would make me, you know, want to do this. It was
was more of, I knew the, you know, we wanted to start up a syndication company. We wanted to buy deals. That was my entire goal. And I didn't feel comfortable going out to investors and saying, hey, come invest, you know, your hard earned money with me, even though I've never done this before, you know, I'll make it work. I, I, that was not the, that was not what I wanted to do. The first deal that we did, I just submerged myself in all the finance and accounting and operations. So I knew how these apartments were run. And then as we bought more and more deals, it wasn't that the deal changed or how the operations changed. It was just scale. So a 36 unit deal runs the same way as like a 150 unit deal. The only difference is now you have a full-time staff on there as opposed to a part-time staff. And the numbers just get bigger. That's all it is. Right, and right. you know how one apartment unit is run, essentially, you can fin you can scale that up to 500 units, 1,000 units, 5,000 units, whatever, as long as you, as you stick to the fundamentals. Awesome. Awesome. And um, that's great to know. Matter of fact, I hear some people say it's easier to run a 360 unit apartment complex than a 36 unit apartment complex, right? Just because of scalability and everything exactly. economies of scale and everything that goes along with that. So um, in term, but it is a big transition too. I mean, I mean, a lot of people is almost like coming from single family to a 36 versus a 36 going to a 360. So you're talking about, you know, it's talking about capital raising and everything that has to go into uh those bigger syndication deals i mean how did you guys prep for that i mean did you build a database out in terms of um the, the folks you're going to raise equity from did you get into pref equity there or how, how was that transition made for you guys yeah no the very first few deals that we syndicated you know we had partnered with uh individuals who were experienced in the in in the in the syndication world right so we didn't go from buying a deal ourselves to just not buying a deal ourselves along with a couple investors um, you know and during the entire period that we were looking for deals uh, we were effectively also building up our investor um, data set, right? So we we would go out, you know, meet people at these conferences, kind of talk about what we wanted to do, not something that we already done, and ask them like, hey, you know, when we do have a deal, is it okay if we send you that deal so you can take a look at it, so let us know what you think, and and you know, if you want to invest, you know, we'd love it for you to invest, but obviously not a requirement. So um, that took, you know, the first deal that we syndicated since I started, it was almost, I would say like almost 12 to 15 months in before I, we got the first deal under contract since I started my entire journey in multifamily. Um, and throughout that entire time, you know, going to meetups, meeting all these people, that was definitely helpful. And our very first set of investors that came into our deals were, you know, you would think you meet 100 people and at least 15, 20 would invest. You probably had like a 1% conversion rate, like one investor out of every 100 people would invest with us, essentially, because we didn't have a track record. You know, it, it makes perfect sense. But my first investors that really kind of stuck by me were my family and, and my close friends from my previous uh, places that I worked at. So, um, you know, even today, you know, my family invests in every single deal that we do. I invest in every single de deal that I do. And then, you know, the first few investors that I invested in 2019 with us on the first syndication that I did. They're still investing with us. Um, they just took a chance with us, which I'm really grateful for. And, uh, you know, they, they stuck by us. So it's, it's really kind of helped everyone kind of grow in, in that respect. So, so Bikram, I, I know uh, you guys raise equity from private investors, you know, your friends, family members, and, you know, all the referrals and all, and all that. Um, have you thought of taking bigger checks from, you know, like REITs or family offices? Do you guys do that kind of business also? What are your thoughts? You know, if if you do, why? And if you don't, why don't you? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that was the second part of um, um, Paul's question here as well on pref equity. So we've always been a syndication company. You know, every single deal that we buy, it's always been, you know, our median check size is always in $50,000 across the, across the spectrum. So, you know, the first few deals we bought, we had maybe 50 to 60 investors. And now we have close to two to 300 investors every single deal, essentially, just because the check sizes for the overall deal has gotten a lot bigger. Um, but, uh, you know, we have kind of flirted with pref equity. We have flirted with like family offices and seeing how they, they work, right? So 
um, and you guys are probably already know this, but as as a check size kind of gets bigger and the equity share gets bigger, the you have to start giving up special member rights. You have to start giving up control of the deal to these pre preferred equity providers. Um, and a perfect example is a deal that we bought in, um, you know, in 2020, where we had a family office partner come in and and essentially put in a check for about 40 percent of the total equity, and we brought in 60 percent. Well, in order to put in 40 percent, this person wanted to have special member rights where they they decided when we could sell the deal, refinance, uh, pay off the loan, or do any sort of capital transactions. And if you wanted to fire the property manager or get a new property manager in, they needed to sign off on it every budget, every year, they needed to approve it. And then if we were over budget or under budget by 10% or more, they needed explanations of what was happening. I mean, we do all that internally, right? So we follow these things in, in a very detailed manner. So we want to make sure we do right by the investors because we have a fiduciary responsibility for our investors to, to essentially help them increase their valuation of their property that they're investing in. Uh, but what happens is when you have somebody coming in with a large check size, when they start taking control over these little things, that's when things can kind of go a little sideways because your interests now are not 100% aligned. Uh, point, point is when we try to sell the deal, you know, that that um, that one deal did very well for this perfect uh, this family office that had come in. They were essentially going to end up around forexing their money in about twelve to twelve to fifteen months, which is a phenomenal return for anyone, right? In in that time period, and um, you know, for that for us to you know sell the deal, they still wanted to sign off on it. They wanted to see every, all the details of whether to whether to refinance or sell it right now, and they were actually leaning towards just refinancing and holding it for ten years. And we were just going crazy. We're like, oh my god, like, where where do you see you know forexing your money in fifteen months? Like I've never heard of that in my entire life. Like sure, you can do that with like a you know startup tech company, but uh, you can't do that in real estate. Like that makes sense to sell. So we had to essentially pay them so we could sell the sell the property. Um, uh, so, you know, that kind of left a little bit of bad taste in our mouth. So we decided to, uh, at that point, not take in any significant check sizes because we didn't want to give up those special member rights. And then uh, around that time, we had like a deal under contract where we brought in a pref equity provider uh, just to kind of supplement the total equity that we needed. And, you know, that one, that relationship was okay as well. It wasn't too bad. But again, they had their own lockouts. They had they wanted to approve a sale before we could sell anything. And this was obviously in the heart of 2021, 2022, when you could sell a deal, keep your eyes closed and double people's money, really. Uh, if you bought at the right place or right time, you didn't really have to do anything. So, you know, around the time that we sold that second deal, they wanted to be paid extra money as well, just so we can induce them to sell the deal. So it's just, it, we didn't want to, you know, be in a situation where it was a good deal for our investors and a good transaction for our investors. And then someone, some other party actually held the rights to essentially stop us from doing something. So since then, we haven't done any pref equity. We don't work with family offices very often. You know, we will once in a while, but we tell them your maximum ownership is going to be 10%. We will not give you any special member rights because, you know, at the end of the day, even if you are coming into the deal, at the end of the day, we have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that we don't just take your money and run away. Uh, you know, we'd get in trouble very quickly for that. Um, so if you don't feel comfortable investing money with us, that's perfectly fine. We're not forcing you. Uh, but if you do want to invest with us, know that we're going to have to keep your best interests at heart because that's the only way we're going to grow. And that's the only way, you know, we're going to bring everybody up to the next level. This is this is an awesome answer. It's a very humble approach. I think uh, that, you know, um, rather than trying to go high fly and, Try to get you know get more deals into the belt in a shorter amount of time, which you did already anyway in, in the last couple of years. But you were able to be you were able to remain humble and remain uh, keeping the interest of you know retail investors at your heart. You were able to produce best results for them while not giving up what you do best is controlling the deal. Right. So that, that's awesome. So in terms of you know let's say jumping from investors to market, you know, I know you guys are very hyper-focused on Phoenix market. What are your thoughts for looking into other markets in Arizona or outside Arizona? You know, what do you think about that? Yeah. So, you know, since we started, we've always done Phoenix, you know, that, that was our bread and butter. And, 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 and our thinking is, 
we want to establish a good blueprint for success in one market before we jump to a different market and try to replicate success in that market. So in Phoenix, what we did was, you know, we first started the equity company to buy the deals and we did third party property management. Well, after we had about 12 to 15 deals, we decided, okay, well, let's bring property management in house. It can stay, you know, relatively profitable, meaning one, 2% gross margins, and it'll stay fine, but we want to bring that in house so we can, again, get that control from an operations perspective and not rely on somebody else. And then uh, second step we did was we started bringing construction management in-house. So, you know, as an equity company, we always manage the business plan, make sure that construction was happening on a, on a timely basis. Well, after we brought property management in-house, we saw, okay, well, the natural next step is also bringing construction in-house where we can, you know, as, as we're renovating the units, you know, we are relying on these third parties to to make sure that the renovations happen on time and we were just seeing so much you know budget delays or timely delays that we were like okay well let's just bring that in house as well so as we started getting vertically integrated in house we started seeing this blueprint kind of form by itself where hey when we buy a deal now it goes through our process and then at the end of the process after 2 to 5 years we get this great result so now we can take this and now replicate it in a different market so we've always liked phoenix you know for the job growth, employment growth, and, and all the companies that are moving here and the, and the story that Phoenix has. Um, so we, you know, at the, at the tail end of last year, we started looking at different markets. We've always wanted to go to a different market. It's just, again, we wanted to get that blueprint in place. And, uh, you know, the natural next step was we wanted to go into Texas. Texas is a big market. You know, there's a lot of great pockets that you can kind of get into. And we, we, we really like Dallas, Fort Worth area. So at around October, November last year, we started flying out to Dallas, started meeting with the brokers, started meeting with, you know, the, the lenders and seeing what type of deals they were seeing on the market. And that's when we started underwriting Dallas deals. So, you know, in February of this year, we closed our first Dallas deal. And then in, you know, just last month, we closed our, our, our second Dallas deal and we're closing a couple more in the next few months. But uh, that was the market we had kind of focused on. And we told ourselves internally, you know, we don't feel comfortable going out to the market, hiring a third party PM, hiring another construction manager to go and do all the work, like essentially starting from scratch that we did in Phoenix. So what we did was we essentially took our property management company out there. We took our construction management out there and we established the infrastructure before we ever got our first deal under contract. We had a regional VP, regional property director, construction manager, asset manager, asset management associate all hired out before we even saw the first deal that we had under contract. So a significant amount of payroll that we were just incurring waiting for the first deal. But we knew that if we had just played our cards right, you know, continue doing what we did in Phoenix, just underwrite deals, underwrite deals and find the right, right deal in the right location, that is what's going to get us to the next level. And lo and behold, you know, we got our, we got four deals in a contract as of today and, and close two of them, I have two more to go. But um, that, that's how we kind of approach that secondary market. Our congratulations on that. I mean, getting into a new market, building those broker relations and things like that ahead of time and getting your infrastructure in place. I mean, that is just that is just phenomenal, phenomenal. So um, how did you uh, how did your your investors um, uh, feel about that? Because most of them knew you in the in a certain market uh, in terms of Arizona. Of course, you're going into a new market now. Did you think they just ride based on the experience they had with you over the years, had the confidence in you, the operator uh, versus uh, the area? Um, how did that kind of um, uh, transfer? I know it's even more challenging these days, raising capital in this market, market has shifted for the past couple of years. How was that experience for you? Yeah, I'll be honest, you know, there was some hesitancy from our investors here and there. I mean, we've been hearing for the past 12 to 18 months uh, before 20, uh, 2022 that investors were kind of over invested in Phoenix and they wanted to invest in different areas. They loved what we were doing in Phoenix. They just couldn't find the same type of operator somewhere else. So when we decided to launch our first Dallas deal, you know, a lot of our investors uh, kind of approached it with a little bit of apprehension where they were like, well, we don't want to be the guinea pig, you know, for your deal. So we, you know, we we laid it out in the investment summary saying like, hey, this is not just us kind of throwing a Hail Mary and seeing, hey, if it sticks, great, we'll not do it again. We are invested in going full force in Dallas. Uh, we don't take any market lightly. We're not going to buy a deal in Dallas tomorrow, then get another deal under contract in North Carolina, and then get one in Florida. And then, uh, we, we don't do that. We, we, right. we, 
we only go into markets where we've vetted completely and, and we have infrastructure in place. So, you know, getting the first deal closed took a little bit of time because we wanted to educate our investors and kind of help them understand it wasn't just a one and done thing. And we've told investors like we want to buy at least 10 to 12 deals in Dallas before we even think about pivoting to a different market because it takes a lot of infrastructure um, and a lot of deals to make sure that infrastructure is good in that market before transitioning out. So it was, you know, there was some hesitancy here and there with us, with, with some of the investors, but they knew how we operate. They know that our business plan in and out, because it's not, it's not, we're not curing cancer. We're renovating these apartment buildings at the end of the day. It's not, it's not rocket science. So, you know, we essentially took our business plan, applied it in Dallas and made sure that we have the infrastructure there to, to support that business plan. And now we're seeing that re renewed demand with our investors to, as we launch deals, we're getting the same type of demand as we were, as we were getting in Phoenix. This is an awesome business awesome way of approaching the business you know make it scalable you know have the infrastructure in place and then make it scalable from one market to another market and then probably from this market to another the exactly. third market so uh, become I, i'm going to take a sta step back you know i mean i will ask you a very fundamental question you know i know you guys have grown you have grown from 2018 to 2023 uh, from 250,000 to $1.93 billion company, in, in, so to say, you know, um, does it give you chills, you know, in the night, you know, when, when you when you see that kind of growth happening, you know, tell me your, your mindset, you know, what, what's going on there, you know? Yeah, no, we try to stay as, stay as humble as possible, right, on our end. Like, I'm not, we don't toot our own horn. We don't go out there and say, hey, we're the, we're the biggest real estate syndication company in the world or anything like that. You know, we we take it one step at a time. Uh, and, you know, the the whole thing that we're doing, it's not, it's not like Zach, Robert, and I thinking we did everything. Like, after the first few deals, you know, we hired our very first employee in March of 2021, and she's been instrumental in making sure that our deals are performing. And then in addition to her, you know, we have our transactions associate that's been making sure that we can close our deals on time and you know since then we've kind of just built out our entire company with employees in every aspect from everything from finance accounting to marketing hr that are instrumental in making sure that these deals perform and that we can continue growing the company yeah you know we took the risk on the very front end and and, and we still do with all the earnest money you know we're putting our personal cash out on the line to close these deals but we don't want people to think that, you know, it's only us. So every time, you know, I talk about, you know, Rice 48, you know, sure, I'm a co-founder, but if you look at me, what I did back then versus today, I do more oversight and make sure that things are running appropriately, but all our people are the ones, the reason that these deals are performing and the reason we're buying more deals. So uh, we take it one step at a time and, you know, we don't look at where we want it. We, we know where we want to go. We want to be the biggest company, biggest real estate company in the world when it comes to real estate. And uh, it's not going to happen if we just look at the goal and not, you know, put the infrastructure there to, to get us there. So, um, we don't think about, you know, how, how how much we've grown. It's more of, okay, well, how do we get to the next step and the next step and the next step? Vikram, this conversation has been very informative to me. It has been very humbling to me. That's the more important part. Talking to you coming from a very humble person, you sound like a very humble person. Uh, you have given very good advices. Uh, you know, I don't have anything to ask. Paul, do you have anything more to ask? Yeah, I mean, um, you, you speak highly about your, your investors, right? And obviously, I mean, at the end of the day, we want to make sure those guys are satisfied. They help us to take these deals down because bottom line, most of the money come from them if you raise equity from them. Give us a story uh, that you think you've impacted one of these, the lives of one of your investors, a good story uh, so far where you think, uh, okay, yeah, I did buy my, this investor. This investor is happy with what we do. Uh, share one of those stories. I'm pretty sure you have quite a few. Yeah, no, we've had a, you know, definitely we have over, I just remember like March of last uh, or this year, we just sent out 6,000 K1s, you know, so we have over 4,000 investors in our database and, you know, we have more than half of them are recurring investors, but, uh, you know, we, we talk to investors a lot and, you know, right now what you're seeing in the market is obviously interest rates have skyrocketed in just over 12 to 18 months. You've seen rent growth essentially get decimated in the same amount of time period. So that, you know, you have like almost like a two punch on multifamily valuations. 
where it's kind of driven it down. And now you have a lot of you know syndicators, including us, that have bridge loans that have gone up in interest expense. So the natural thing to do for some individuals is try to hide, you know, the not be as transparent with investors because they might not like what they see. Right. So um, we have taken the approach of making sure that we are as transparent as possible with investors. So um, that's been the approach we've taken since day one. We've never like shied away from sharing any details of the deals because you, when you're coming in as an equity investor, you deserve to know what you're investing in and what type of you know risk are associated with it. We've had investors literally ask us for like debt term sheets, the PSA to make sure you know they know what deal it is and what type of debt's being placed. And we're happy to send it over. We want you to be comfortable in investing with us, not just trusting us with our own um, analysis. Uh, I've sent over my underwriting analysis, like completely open. You can feel able to change numbers in there, see what type of uh, numbers you think are appropriate so you can, you know, vet the deal yourself. Um, and, you know, the feedback that we've gotten over the years is you guys are very transparent in your, in your, in your performance, as well as your, you know, reporting. Every report that we send out on a monthly basis is, you know, it's, uh, we send out the entire property management package to every single investor. It's like 120 pages of data, including mortgage statements, AP, AP statements, AR statements, everything that we could, we send it out to them. We also send an executive summary that shows like a 10 page e executive summary, details about the market, the property, how the fin finance is running, how the construction is running. Um, so investors have all that data. So the feedback um, you know, it's not just one investor. We have multiple investors come back and say, hey, a lot of the sponsors they work with, they're just kind of hiding behind, hey, here's the NOI, here's how much we've grown, see you next month. That's all they kind of get. And that's what been my personal experience as well with a couple of syndicators that I've invested with. You know, I get maybe like one or two executive summaries a year about how a deal is doing. And, you know, that's not comforting as an investor. So, you know, when I put myself in an investor's place, I want to know uh, as an investor what's happening at the deal, uh, almost to like a very minutia of a detail. And, you know, that's where we've gotten a lot of feedback saying like, hey, you guys do a great job with reporting. Thank you for, you know, letting us know how these deals are doing. And then, you know, some investors that were with us from the very beginning, they're very pleased with the results that they've gotten, that they're continuing to invest with us. So, you know, we've helped increase some individuals, you know, net worth almost three to four X because of the deals that they've done and, you know, all, how much they've kind of stuck by us. And they're very grateful and they continue to invest with us in, in, in our deals because they know we don't just, you know, take the acquisition fee and, and chase after the next one and the next one, and the next one. Uh, Bikram, thanks for sharing that. that. Those are definitely golden nuggets that um, give uh, different operators an insight as to why you guys have probably grown so much. And uh, that, this is a beautiful thing to hear that you guys are so transparent. We're going to transition now into the lightning round of our um, podcast. And uh, I'm going to ask you, what, what what's one piece of advice that impacts your life and how you, for, that you receive from someone else and how you think it may help others? Yeah, I think the the biggest thing that kind of helped me transition my mindset over into real estate and being, you know, an entrepreneur was um, there was a book I read called Find Your Why by Simon Sinek. It's a great little book. Um, you know, I think we all get sometimes like when we're in, in the in the details of things, we're always trying to figure out what we're doing and how we're going to do it. We never really take time to figure out why we're doing something. So, you know, as we kind of built up Rise 48 Equity, the main thing that, you know, on my departments that I was helping hone out was every single person that we hired, I told them, this is what we do currently. This is why we do it. So you understand the, the mission that we're trying to accomplish. So the what is not as important. I want to answer the why behind that problem. That way, when that new person is coming in and taking charge of the, the process, they can understand the underlying reason for the process and they can make it better. Because um, I only have so much you know, knowledge in my head. If they're coming in with a plethora of experience, they can take that why and take it to the next level. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, of course, we're going to ask you about uh, one book you recommend that you already did. It's Finding Your Why. And uh, I forget the author's name. Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek. Now, share with us one of your personal habits that co that's contribute to your success. What's one habit that you have that contribute to your success? Yeah. So, you know, I'm like a, I'm a decision maker on a number of different aspects on, on yeah. and 
company and my personal life, obviously. So, you know, we're, we're in the midst of, you know, building a home that we want to live in. And, and uh, my, you know, we have a construction build, uh, con a general contract is doing all the work, but whenever it comes to making decisions, I want to make sure I understand the entire in and out of that decision before I'm off on it. So one thing I've always kind of done on my end is make sure I have all the facts, uh, whether it's related to Rise 48 or personal stuff, before I, I sign off on something or I say I want to do this or that. I feel like it's very important because you're going to be relying on that. You're going to be standing by your decision. You don't. You never want to be in a situation where you say, you know, well, I didn't know what I was doing, so I said yes to this. So you always want to make sure you have, uh, you know, the complete facts before you make that decision. Cool, cool. And now we're just we're going to end it uh, podcast here today. We appreciate you being here. We're just going to give you the mic for a second just to let uh, just share with us. Um, any parting advice you may have, any type of parting advice, and how can folks connect with you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you, you guys can reach me out and uh, at rise48equity.com. Um, you know, there's a link up there that says like, you know, invest now, click on that. My calendar is right there. You can reach out to me via my phone number or my email. It's bikron at rise48equity.com. And I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. I think the biggest piece of advice I would give back and what's kind of helped me get to where I am is, you know, once you've identified what you want to do, you know, it could be retail, industrial, multifamily, whatever, submerge yourself in the ins and outs of that industry. Because at the end of the day, you know, your goal should be, you want to scale that, scale that company as big as possible. And you're not going to be able to do it if you don't understand point A to point B on everything that happens at that site. So that's what I did. You know, with the first deal that we bought, I, I, I just engrossed myself with everything related to that property. And then that's how we've been able to scale is because I've understood as I go, as opposed to just saying, okay, all I do is underwriting, you guys take care of everything else. That's not the mindset you want to have. Vikram, it, it was a pleasure having you on this podcast and it, you know, an honor, honor that you could share the time with us, you know, um, for our audience. I personally was, you know, I'm pumped up. I would love to see you grow and, uh, you know, wish you, wish you best of luck. Thank you so much for your time. Of course. No, thanks. Thank you, for, oh, really appreciate you guys. And thanks for having me on, on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Cashflow Champs Podcast. Cashflow Champs partners with busy working professionals and entrepreneurs that want to build and maintain generational wealth through real estate. Visit CashflowChamps.com to learn more about us.